Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. So glad all of you are able to be here. And those who may have just moved to North Carolina not long ago, welcome to North Carolina. Last week, we were freezing to death. Yesterday, the beaches were full of people walking up and down, including my wife and myself. So just welcome. And before we get started this morning, I just want to say that we are so grateful for all of our staff who serve and who are faithful and ministering to one another, ministering to you. And especially those staff who have hit some milestones. And we have one in our, our, among our team who has hit a milestone in two ways today. And that's Carol Batts. She began 34 years ago today at Scotts Hill. And she's also retiring. And so we've got both of those things happening. While we celebrate on one hand Carol's um faithfulness here for 34 years, we also are saddened on the other side that she's going to be leaving us and she's no longer going to be the queen of Scotts Hill taking care of everyone on staff. So here's what we do. We normally recognize them. We normally bring them on a platform. We normally give them a plaque and some financial gift, but Carol would have none of that. And so she doesn't want to come on a platform, but if you know Carol and you appreciate Carol, when you get the opportunity, here's what I would encourage you to do. A couple of things. Maybe give her a card and maybe a gift certificate or something in there just to demonstrate your appreciation for her 34 years of service. And we want to celebrate together. So we just give thanks to God for Carol Batts and her faithfulness at Scottsdale. Yeah. I don't know if you're in a Cross Point Carol or a Cross Point Center or where you are, but we just love you and we appreciate you. I've told you before that um, our family loves amusement parks. And when our kids were growing up, the highlights of the amusement park were always finding the roller coaster rides. And we had the perfect roller coaster family. There were four of us, Chris and myself and Ryan and Leslie. And when you only have four, it's real easy to get on roller coasters. You either fill in a whole row or you break up in two groups of two. And so we loved roller coasters, and we'd get to these amusement parks, we would navigate ourselves in that line and try to get to the very front of the car, because that's the most exciting part of the ride, is on the front end. And so we would get in there, we'd strap ourselves in, and then that roller coaster would take off, and it would slowly click up that hill, click, 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 and as it goes up the hill, it would drop on that first one, and there was this exhilarating fall. Man, your ride has begun, and you're excited, and then it makes a bank to the right, it does a loop, it does all kinds of ups and downs, makes this fantastic um, turn down towards the finale. Everybody's got their hands up in the air. We're looking for the camera. And, uh, and, and as we pass that camera, you're on the ride of your life. Then all of a sudden, it comes to a screeching halt. And the ride's over. 30 seconds, two hours in line, 30 seconds of exhilarating fun. Then you get off the roller coaster and you transition through the park to get to another one so you can do the same thing all over again. That's what I feel like we've been on with the book of Romans. We started off slow and clicking up that hill. And then we have that drop where he tells us that we're all under the judgment and the wrath of God. And then we make that banking turn and we start to hear of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. And we make the loop of justification by our faith and that we're forgiven, we're acquitted of all of our sins. Then all of a sudden, we make that last bankment coming up over the hill with our hands celebrating in the air, rejoicing because there is no condemnation and no separation in Christ Jesus. And we're looking for the camera of joy. And then we come and whoop, we stop at the end of chapter eight. And when we come into this strange section of Romans nine, 10 and 11, and it's as though the entire atmosphere has changed. He's led us to this spiritual high. And now he comes into these chapters that can be very confusing to us. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 speak of Israel's rejection and ultimate blessings. But in the midst of those three chapters, he makes this sudden shift and he begins to talk about the sovereignty of God in history and the sovereignty of God in salvation. And when it comes to that point, he brings us to probably one of the most difficult doctrines in all of the New Testament, 
And that's known as the doctrine of election. And the doctrine of election is, has its focus on two issues, the sovereignty of God in all things and the responsibility of men to respond to God. And so it's based upon those two things. And all through history, there have been camps that have argued between these two things, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of humanity. How do we reconcile those things? And we've yet to find the best way to do that because through the course of history, great men have debated over this. Augustine and Pelagius. Augustine was firmly based on the sovereignty of God in all things, including our salvation. And Pelagius believed in the free will of man in all things in choosing salvation. Now, Pelagius also believed that no person was born with original sin, that you only became a sinner when you sinned. He was later condemned as a heretic and removed from the church. But then that grew from another person, John Calvin and Jacob Arminius. And John Calvin held very strongly to Calvinism beliefs, which is the sovereignty of God in all things. And Jacob Arminius held very firmly on the free will of humanity when it comes to salvation. And they have had their debates. And as a result of that, there were two count camps that have been found over the years called Calvinism and Arminianism. And even in Baptist churches all around the world, these two camps seem to come at each other and are always combating and arguing. And there's been a lot of division in that. When it comes down to that, there have been other camps that have developed over that. People have asked me, Phil, where are we in this whole debate? Where do we find ourselves in these two camps? Are we Calvinist or are we Arminian? Well, we would say what we are is we're Reformed. And being Reformed recognizes that there's always a tension between those two things. That we believe strongly in the sovereignty of God, that God as sovereign can exercise his sovereignty freely any way he chooses, but there is also human responsibility, that we are responsible to, to respond to the grace of God. Now, even in that, that choosing or responding to God, God is at work even in the midst of that. So would we call ourselves reformed? We would say that all of our elders and our pastors fall within that category. But we do not use the label Calvinism. We do not use the label Reformed. The reason is those can mean different things to different churches. Here's what we have agreed that we will be. We are Biblicist. We're going to teach the truth of God's word as it unfolds in Scripture. And we're always going to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And that means that we are going to have to choose some difficult topics. We're not going to stay away from difficult topics. We're going to teach those with the clearest understanding that we can gain for the purpose and the glory of God and for the saints to come together. Now, when it comes to issues like these, there are going to be differences. There are going to be different positions that we may hold to. But none of these things undermine the, 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 the reality that it is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And we will always unite around the gospel. So when we get in chapter 9, 10, and 11, we're going to be dealing with some really heady issues of sovereignty and responsibility. Now, when we read these chapters, we really need to read them in a unit. Last week, I told you to read chapter 9. Scratch your head. Come here and listen to, as we unfold this. But we really need to read 9, 10, and 11. And, and, and here's why. Here's a simple chart. In chapter 9, Paul emphasizes God's sovereignty in history and salvation. He's talking about God's freedom to do what he wishes. One thing we need to remember, he is God and we are not. This, in chapter 10, it speaks of man's responsibility in salvation. All right? We understand what our role is and how God works in our lives and how we respond to his grace in our life. And then chapter 11 deals with sovereignty and responsibility and salvation together. 
It helps us to understand it. So if you only look at chapter 9, you will just see God's sovereignty, and you would say, okay, where's man's responsibility? If you only look at chapter 10, you would see man's responsibility, but you would miss out on God's sovereign part in that. And if you read only chapter 11, you'll be confused. So we're going to tie all of these together to help us to see that he's not only talking about Israel's past and future but the greater picture is here is that God is sovereign and he is free to do as he wishes. And we need to understand what that means in our life and how we play this out. Now, I, I realize I've got, whoo, man, the time is already gone. And I've got a little bit of time left to do all of chapter nine. So take your Bibles, open Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a little bit. I'm going to make a few comments. We're going to read a bit. I'm going to make some comments. And then we're going to tie it all together at the end in the application for what it means for us. Okay? Let's begin by prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hard parts of scripture that force us to, to seek to understand your heart and your mind in all things. I pray, Father, that you would guide me today in a very succinct way of what you would want us to know about you, your will, your sovereign freedom, and your purposes in election. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Paul begins chapter nine with the sincere heart for the lost people of Israel. The people of Israel have basically rejected the message of the gospel and they've rejected Christ. So Paul begins in the first three verses stating that he has a sincere love for those who are his people. And he puts it this way. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For if I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul has this incredible passion that he would even, if possible, give up his salvation so that his fellow Jews would be saved. Now, Paul is not suggesting that a person can lose their salvation. He's stating the impossible. He cannot lose his salvation, but if it were possible, he would be willing to give up the most precious thing that others would come to know Christ. And let me tell you, this, this passage convicted me last week because if Paul is willing to give up his salvation for the lost, I wonder, what am I willing to give up to reach lost people? I can't give up my salvation. We know that is secure, but what I'm, am I willing to give up my time? Am I willing to give up my talents? Am I willing to give up my treasures? Am I willing to give up my inconveniences? Am I willing to give up my comfort? Am I willing to give up the ease of my life that I can tell others about Christ? You hear the burden he had? What an incredible burden. And it just reminds us that's the kind of burden we are to have for lost people. We are constantly be concerned for them in the sense that we need to tell them about Jesus because he's the only one who can transform their lives. And just because you have a strong belief in the sovereignty of God doesn't mean you don't have a responsibility to tell people about Jesus. That should drive us all the more to tell people that they need a savior who can lead them into an everlasting relationship with him. Now, why is he so grieved? Verses four and five. He says, they are Israelites. <laughs> They're the chosen people of God. And to them belong the adoption. They are the sons and daughters of God. The glory, the very presence, the Shekinah glory of God. The covenants from, from um, Adam in the garden all the way to David. The giving of the law. They had the Ten Commandments, the worship, the tabernacle, and the temple and the promises of God. To them belong the patriarchs, which were all the prophets, and from their race, their own flesh, comes the Christ, who is Jesus, who is God over all, blessed forever. In other words, they've rejected every single thing that God gave to them, and yet Paul's heart is broken over this. Now, Paul has just set up his whole argument about God's sovereignty. Because he has this imaginary inquisitor coming and asking questions. 
And this inquisitor is going to ask four questions in chapter 9, and every one of those questions is going to lead Paul to teach us a truth about the sovereignty of God. Now, God's sovereignty is that he does as he pleases, when he pleases, and everything he does pleases him. He's the omnipotent God. He does not need our permission to do anything. He is God. We are not. And this inquisitor comes, and he begins asking questions. And the first question leads us to the very first point that Paul wants to teach us about God's sovereignty. And here it is, that God works out his sovereign purposes in history. God is always going to work out his sovereign purposes through history. And the question that this inquisitor asks is, has God's promises failed Israel? Well, wait a minute, Paul. They've got all of these wonderful blessings. They've got the prophets. They've got the law. They've got the temple. They've got the very glory of God. They even had Christ, and they nailed him to the cross. Isn't God, aren't his promises failing the people of Israel? Is it that, that, that if God's failing the people of Israel, could he possibly even fail us? And so Paul answers that. And what does he say? But it is not as though the word of God has failed. God forbid, his word has not failed Israel. Then he goes on. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. In other words, he's saying this. Listen, just because a person is born in a nation of Israel doesn't make them a true Israelite. Just because a person is, is, is from Abraham does not make them a true son of Abraham. Your descendancy, your ancestry doesn't make you anything special. Why? Here's why. He doesn't play on words. The name Israel means governed by God. And what he's saying is this. Not everybody in Israel is governed by God. Not everybody in Israel has been called by him, have surrendered their lives to him, who have chosen to walk faithfully before him and have been counted righteous before, because of that. Not everybody in Israel is a true Israelite. In other words, there is an Israel within Israel. And that Israel that's governed by God, those are the ones who belong to God. The same is true in the life of the church. We got church goers all the time. Not every church goer is in the church. Oh, sure, there's the organization of the church, but then there's the living organism that's the church. And there are many people who will go to church every single Sunday, and they might have an aunt, an uncle, a mom, a dad, a grandmother, a grandfather, a cousin, a brother who are Christians, but that does not make them a Christian. You see, only those who have been called by God and who have submitted to God and have responded to his grace and walked by faith in Christ is the true church. And so Paul's saying, no, it hasn't, it hasn't failed. God never promised to save everybody in Israel. And then he gives this wonderful illustration of how God sovereignly chooses in history to use those whom he wants to use for his purposes. First, he gives us two brothers, Isaac over Ishmael. In verses 7 through 9, he tells us that God chooses Isaac over Ishmael. Here's how he lays it out. He says, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Ishmael is the son of Abraham and Hagar. That was Sarah's handmaiden. Remember, Abraham and Sarah could not have children. God appeared to them and said, Sarah, you're going to have a child of promise. One day you'll get pregnant. Well, they waited, waited, waited. Nothing happened. So what did she do? She decided on her own. They're going to get their own son. So she says, Abraham, here's my, my handmaiden, Hagar. I want you to sleep with her and give me a son. And Abraham said, all right. <laughs> Yeah, if you want, you know. And so he's married to her, and they have Ishmael. And Ishmael's growing up, okay? And then Sarah becomes pregnant, and she has Isaac. 
And what God says is before any of this has happened, God already chose that Isaac would be the one from whom the line of the Messiah would come. And we see even in the Old Testament, God sovereignly choosing for his purpose in history. But we see it in a second way. We see it in Jacob and Esau. The same thing happens, verses 10 through 13. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, which was Isaac, our, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told that the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. This is a verse that gives a lot of people problem. What is God saying here? The same thing. When it comes to choosing people who will fulfill his purpose in history, God sovereignly has the freedom to do that. And what does he do? He chooses Jacob over Esau. Now, you might say, well, that's a, that's a, that's a good choice because Esau despised his birthright, right? Esau didn't love the things of God. So it's easy for God to choose Jacob. Really? Well, Jacob wasn't a saint either. Jacob was a deceiver. He was dishonest. He tricked people. And besides, God didn't look through the corridor of time to see which one would be the better one because both of them were wicked. And before they were even born, before anything ever happened, God said, I will set my love on Jacob. When he says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, people struggle with that. The better word for hated, I agree with Douglas Moo, Calvin, and um, John Stott, and a number of other ones. The word hated would better be um, um, rejected, because God's not talking about love and hate here. He's talking about an action, and he's basically saying, Jacob, I have accepted. Esau, I have rejected, and here's the point. As sovereign God, doesn't he have the right to do what he wishes? As sovereign God, why does he do it? To fulfill the purposes of his election that they might continue. Somebody came to see H. Spurgeon one day. It was a lady. She said, I have a real hard time understanding a God who would hate Esau. He said, Madam, I have a hard time understanding a God who would love Jacob. Because each man was guilty. Each man, he neither was innocent. In reality, they were both sinners that really deserved the justice of God. But in God's sovereignty, what has he done? He has chosen certain people through the course of history to fulfill his purposes of election. And we cannot fully understand that. So we see all through history, the hand of God and the providence of God as he's setting up kings and tearing kings down, which demonstrates his sovereign freedom over all things. That's the first truth we just need to understand. But then Paul teaches a second thing. He says, God is always just and his salvation is always based upon mercy. God is just And his salvation is always based upon mercy. It's never based upon our merits. Now, he's imagining this inquisitor. Well, hasn't God failed Israel? And he says, no. God has accomplished his eternal purposes in the way he's worked. Then that person asks the next question. Well, isn't God unfair in his sovereign choice? Isn't it unfair if God would choose some for mercy and some for wrath? Isn't God unjust if he does that? That's the basic question that he's asking. And so many people ask this question when it comes to the issue of the sovereignty of God. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. If God is free to choose, isn't that unfair? Notice Paul's response. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. The issue here is not about the fairness of God. The issue here is about the justice of God. Justice is something that we deserve. Mercy is something that we don't deserve. If God chooses to pour out his just wrath on a sinner, he's not unjust for doing that. He has the right to do that. 
But if God decides to pour out his mercy on a sinner, he is not unjust to do that because it demonstrates his mercy. And Paul helps us to understand this by reaching back in the life of Moses. For he says, to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Here's the bottom line. Every single one of us we saw at the beginning of Romans, we're all under the judgment of God because of our sin. We're all rightfully under his justice. And God has the just right to be able to pour his wrath out or he has the right in his sovereign freedom to pour out his mercy. And he is not unjust to do either of those things. Here's our big struggle. Here's our big struggle. We want God to be fair, don't we? We want God to be fair. Well, it's not fair, God. It's not fair if if you pour your love on this one, but you put your wrath on this one. That's not fair. Let me ask you a question. Do you really want God to be fair to you? Do you? Fairness would send every single one of us to hell. And God would be just. He would be right. He would be within his sovereign freedom to do just that. And what Paul is saying here, it's not about fairness. It's about his justice and his mercy. And in his sovereignty, he has the freedom to do either. Paul reaches back further and he says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Here's another verse that people struggle with. Wait, 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 God hardened Pharaoh's heart? That is true. But what we see in scripture is that Pharaoh first hardened his own heart. You know, five times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then after all those times it says God hardened his heart. What does that mean? God just let him go the way and the direction of his heart. God says, you don't want to listen to me? You're not willing to submit to me? Then I'll let you live out of the condition of your heart. And by doing that, God allowed his heart to become hardened because Pharaoh had already made the choice that he was going to do that. And even in the midst of that, God just let him go. And there's a reminder to me that God in his justice could just let us all go our way. But God in his love and his mercy, what does he do? He comes and he convicts our hearts. He begins to speak to us about our sin. He shows us who he is. We hear the gospel of Christ and his mercy washes over us. And it demonstrates his mercy and his justice. I love what um, John Stott wrote, one of my favorite commentators. I actually have a book on my coffee table in my office. He was a... um, an avid bird watcher, and he signed that book just for me because I had some conversations over the years with him through letters and such. And so John Stott writes this. I love this. He says, if therefore God hardened some, he is not being unjust, for that is what their sin deserves. If on the other hand, he has compassion on some, he is not being unjust, for he is dealing with them in mercy. The wonder is not that some are saved and others are not, but that anyone is saved at all. For we deserve nothing at God's hands but judgment. He goes on. If we receive what we deserve, which is judgment, or we receive what we do not deserve, which is mercy, in neither case is God unjust. If therefore anybody is lost, the blame is theirs. But if anybody is saved, the credit is God's. This antinomy contains a mystery which our present knowledge cannot solve, but it is consistent with scripture, history, and experience. The gospel, the doctrine of election is an antinomy. An antinomy is when you have two equally valid truths that when they stand side by side, they seem to contradict. Chosen from the foundation of the earth, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sovereignty, human responsibility. 
And we cannot reconcile these things in our mind. It's a mystery. And yet in the midst of this, we try to figure out, we divide into camps, we get all worked up against one another rather than recognizing both are true. I can give you a beautiful picture of this. Uh, Years ago, I heard Chip Ingram. I was at at a church and he was speaking there as a guest speaker. And he was speaking about the sovereignty of God, which is funny because he was in an Arminian church. And he's preaching on the sovereignty of God. And he talks about there'd be like two ropes coming down from heaven. You can't see where they go, but you can only see them coming down. And on one rope, it says chosen from the foundations of the earth. The other rope, it says whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. They're both here. They're both equal. But if you put weight on this one, this one comes up. You put weight on this one, this one comes up. And while we see that they're two separate ropes in heaven, they're the same rope that come all the way down in a mystery that you and I cannot comprehend. But in the midst of that, it is God's sovereignty that works in our lives that bring us to understand truth and that calls us to repentance, to turn to him. Here's the third point. Um, God has the sovereign right over his creation. And he gives a beautiful illustration of this. The inquisitor asked the question again. He's like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not fair. It's not fair. Then he says this. If God sovereignly chooses, then why does he find fault in those who don't respond to his grace? If God is the one who's choosing, he's working all the situations in my life, and if he chooses this person, but I'm not chosen, then how can he call, hold me at fault? This was a person who's not willing to be responsible. This was a person who's asking this question in an arrogant way, trying to trip Paul up. How does Paul respond? (laughs) He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer God back? It's like the man's going to stand before God one day and say, well, I got one for you, God. You've been working in your sovereignty. You've been doing all this, and yet I haven't experienced your sovereign grace in my life, so how can you hold me responsible? Can you imagine somebody yelling at God like that? It might sound like, yes to me, God. And Paul is saying, who are you? to stand before the creator of the universe and tell him how he is to run all things. Then he gives this illustration of the potter. What will will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? He's just saying, doesn't the potter have the authority? And every one of us would say yes. I mean, the clay never says, I really don't like the way you make me. I want you to be able to make me in a little different way. We hear a lot of that today when people don't like their sexuality and gender. Isn't that true? But God has a sovereign right to do what he wants. And then he goes on. This is a really verse that really gets people. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand in glory. So my two kind of vessels, those prepared for destruction, those are vessels of mercy. And the ones who are prepared for destruction, some people misinterpret this. They say that God has a double predestination, that some he predestines to hell and some he predestines to heaven. That is not true. That's a wrong view. Besides, this passage does not say that God prepared them for destruction. You want to know why? We prepare ourselves just fine for destruction, don't we? Every one of us is born sinners. We're already geared towards an eternity separated from God. And it's been God's mercy and patience that he's worked with these before they experienced the destruction that they themselves have prepared through a rebellious, unbelieving heart. But those who have yielded to his grace and his mercy are those are the ones that display his glory. And God is not unjust to pour his wrath on those who deserve it and to pour his grace on those who don't deserve it. This is a difficult picture for us to grasp. 
Yet, at the same time, we are responsible to respond to the message of the gospel. Now, let me give you the last point, and I'll tie it all together. God's sovereign plan includes the nations. And here's an encouraging part. Because of the rejection that Israel has towards God's promises, God poured his grace on the Gentiles, which is us. And because of his great love, we can experience his great mercy. He gives the illustration from Hosea. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. We who were once not his people now have the opportunity because of his grace to be his people. Then in Isaiah, cries out in concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. It was God's mercy. And because of that, God has poured his grace on all nations. Now, the sovereignty of God, the responsibility of men. God sovereignly working among us we call to respond to his grace and yield to him. This is a mystery. This is one that we cannot figure out. And here's what's interesting. The apostle Paul never tries to reconcile them. He doesn't. He just states them as a reality. So what do we do with all of this? When it comes to the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of men, how do, we, how do we respond to this? Let me give you some applications. Number one, worship God for his amazing grace. Listen to me carefully. If you are in Christ and you are a son or daughter of God, you did not get there by your merit. You got there by God's mercy. And you will not stand in heaven one day patting yourself on the back for your salvation you will be on your face before your Savior for his mercy and his grace, which you never deserved. When we get to this place, it should drive us to the place of saying, God, of all the people, of all the people who have ever lived, you set your love on me. You came to me. You pointed the truth to me. It's only because of your mercy and your grace that I'm even before you. And I worship you and I worship you and I worship you and I never lose sight of that kind of love for me. Here's the second thing. Remind yourself that you don't deserve such grace. In other words, we walk humbly. And we walk every day recognizing that the grace I have is just simply from a loving, sovereign God who has loved me. Here's the third thing. Embrace the mysteries of God even though you don't understand them. Embrace them. And, and, and I'll add another one in there. Don't let these kinds of mysteries trip you up in your fellowship with people who may not agree with you. This is not a main component of the gospel message. Now, it may determine how I share the gospel, but it is not the central theme of the gospel. The central theme of the gospel is what Jesus came and did for you so that you can be forgiven and be a part of the family of God. So we embrace these and just trust God that you don't have to know it all. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that, this, that the secret things belong to God, but those that he's revealed to his children are for generations. And so what do we do? We rest in the fact that we can't know it all. Number four, ask God to give you a burden for the lost. I mean, really, do I really have a burden for lost people? Now, some people will say, well, if you really believe like a Calvinist and an ultra-Calvinist, then you never share the gospel because God's going to actually work it out. No, that's not even true because the scripture tells us to share the gospel. I love what C.H. Spurgeon once said. He says, as far as I know, 
God has, hasn't written the letter E on men's bellies, so I can't pull up their shirt tail to see if they're elected. I just tell them about Jesus. And I tell everybody about Christ. Fifthly, never get over the wonder of God's saving grace in your life. Never get over it. Never get over it. I have dear brothers who are Arminian and who lay heavily on the free will of man. I have dear brothers who are in the Calvinistic camp and some hyper-Calvinistic. And I have brothers and sisters who are in the middle. What we do is we walk together believing that God is God and he can do what he wants. And that we have a responsibility to respond to him through his grace and his mercy. And that's all I need to know. And that's how we live when it comes to these mysteries of God's sovereignty in our lives. I would say this, if you're not a believer, if you're not a believer, but something strange has been happening in your life, if you're not a believer, but God has been working in your mind and in your heart and you're starting to have this draw towards him and these desires towards him that you've never had and all of these things are happening and your mind is changing and you're getting this, this clarity and this passion that you've never had, my friend, that is God. And that's his mercy. Yield to that and respond to that in your responsibility. And as children of God, we walk knowing that he's absolutely in control of all things. And I can rest in his sovereignty completely. Next week, chapter 10, we'll be dealing with the responsibility that we have of God's call in our life. And this is the second part. You need to be here to hear the second part of that. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for our time together today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand. And any questions that we might have, Father, that you would bring to us clarity. That we would be able to wrestle with these things even. So that we can understand that you are at work in all things. You do not treat us as puppets by just simply pulling strings in our lives. But Father, you treat us with grace and mercy to point us to truth that we might yield to you, the lover of our souls. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.